Chapter 2. The Immaculate Conception. A woman destined from all eternity to save the world by deifying our nature, and to bear in her chaste womb, him whose tent is the sun, and whose footsteps are on the highest heavens. A woman expected from the beginning of the world, revealed by God even in paradise, and the acknowledged end of all the holy generations who succeeded each other from the days of the patriarchs. Note. According to St. Augustine, the issue to which all the patriarchs aspired was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ and Mary, through whom alone they could expect him. And in fact, says he, if nature, in all her efforts, tends to Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of ages, it is not that she flatters herself that she can reach the Son of God by herself. The extent of her power stops at the humble Mary, who is to engender the blessed seed, not by virtue of her ancestors, but by that of the Most High. She can be no ordinary creature, and must needs have superhuman prerogatives. The pious belief of the Immaculate Conception of Mary is the result of that sentiment of respect. Heirs of an unfortunate parent, degraded by our rebellious father, blighted by the sentence which condemns him, so far from receiving from him the life of grace, we have received from him the death of sin, and, by a fearful doom, are condemned even before our birth. This misfortune, inherent in the human race, accursed as one man in its very origin, is common to all, and the scripture makes no exception in favor of any son of Adam. But the piety of the faithful cannot bear the idea that the mother of God should be submitted to the scathing condemnation, whereby we are stamped with the seal of hell, even in our mother's womb, they have believed that the sovereign judge must have suspended the general effect of his rigorous law in favor of her who was brought into the world, only to contribute to the accomplishment of the most secret, the most incomprehensible of the decrees of God, the incarnation of the Messiah. Notwithstanding the silence of the gospel, it has, therefore, been generally supposed that the Virgin, in anticipation of her divine maternity, was withheld, so to speak, on the verge of the dread abyss, hollowed under our feet, by the fatal disobedience of our first parents, and that her conception is immaculate as her life. This belief, which the Greeks borrowed from Palestine, and adopted with enthusiasm. Note. We find in the Manis secret practices, so ancient in use among the Greeks, these words, which clearly prove their belief in the Immaculate Conception, by a special dispensation, the Lord decreed that the Blessed Virgin, should be as pure, from the first moment of her existence, as was suitable and becoming for her, who was to conceive and to bring forth Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, gave rise to the institution of the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which was celebrated with great pomp in Constantinople, from the 6th century. Note. Saint Andrew, of Crete, makes mention of this Feast of the Immaculate Conception, the office of which Saint Sabas had composed, and to which Saint Germanus, Patriarch of Constantinople, had added an anthem. In the West, on the contrary, this doctrine met opponents, and powerful opponents, for Saint Anselm, Saint Bernard, Saint Bonaventure, Saint Thomas Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, and many other pious and learned doctors, all great theologians. Note. The opponents of the Immaculate Conception are wont to boast of having in their ranks Saint Anselm, Saint Bernard, Saint Bonaventure, Saint Thomas, Albertus Magnus, etc. However great these names may be, yet we must not be dazzled by them, for, confronting these doctors with themselves, we find that they have positively maintained the yea and nay, which shows, either that their opinions on this subject were not fixed, or that they had singular distractions. And, moreover, devoted to the service of Mary, maintained that she was conceived in sin and subjected to the common law, although she was very soon entirely purified therefrom, by a special and excellent grace, which commenced her glorious state of Mother of God. But the belief in the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin prevailed, at length, over the opinion of the great doctors of the Middle Ages. What the eagles of the school had not seen, was revealed to the simple. The writings of the doctors and of the apostles were again searched. A more careful examination was made of what has been handed down to us, regarding the greatness and glory of Mary, and that investigation served to throw a more vivid light on this doubtful point in the life of the Mother of Christ. And in fact, 
Going back even to the Apostles, we already see the title of blessed and immaculate applied to Mary. The Apostle Saint Andrew, quoted by the Babylonian Abdias, expresses himself in these terms, even as the first Adam was made of the earth before it was cursed, so was the second Adam, formed of a pure virgin, who was never under the ban. The saints and martyrs who lived in the third century, Saint Hippolytus, Martyr, Origen, Saint Denis of Alexandria, all give to the Blessed Virgin the qualification of pure and immaculate. Saint Cyprian is more precise, and says clearly that there is a great difference between the rest of mortals and the Virgin and that she has nothing in common with them, but nature, not sin. In the 4th century, Saint Ambrose, who compares the Virgin to a bright and luminous stem, whereon has never been, either the knot of original sin, or the bark of actual sin. Saint John Chrysostom, who proclaims her most holy, immaculate, blessed above all creatures. Saint Jerome, who poetically calls her the day cloud, which never knew darkness. Saint Basil, whom the defenders of the Immaculate Conception are proud to regard as their leader. These have never varied regarding that stainless purity which so well becomes the Queen of Angels. In the 5th century, Saint Augustine cannot endure to have the name of Mary mentioned when there is question of sin. Note: It must be observed that Saint Augustine was then defending the doctrine of original sin against the Pelagians. And Saint Peter Chrysologus affirms that, in the Virgin all were saved. Saint Fulgentius, who lived in the beginning of the 6th century, says that the Blessed Virgin was entirely excluded from the first decree. It is very wrong, says Saint Ildefonso, Archbishop of Toledo, who flourished in the same century. It is very wrong to think of subjecting the Mother of God to the laws of nature. It is certain that she was free and exempt from all original sin, and that she has removed the curse of Eve. Saint John Damascene, speaking expressly of her conception, says that she was pure and immaculate. In the 9th century, Theophanes, abbot of Grand Champ, in the 10th, Saint Fulbert, bishop of Chartres, towards the middle of the 11th, Eve of Chartres, one of the most brilliant lights of that period, and a little later Saint Bruno, founder of the Carthusians. Note, the two holy bishops of Chartres, Fulbert and Eve, declared for the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception, Eve maintained it in the pulpit, and Fulbert says in his paraphrase on the angel's salutation to Mary. Translation, Hail Mary, chosen and distinguished among the daughters, who have always existed immaculate from the beginning of your creation, because you were the creator of all holiness. Saint Bruno, in his explanation of those words of Psalm chapter 101, the Lord looked down from heaven to earth, which he applies to the Blessed Virgin, are evidently in favor of the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin. Islamism itself declares for the Immaculate Conception, and the Arab commentators on the Quran have adopted, in their own way, the opinion of the Catholic theologians who have pronounced in favor of that doctrine. Every descendant of Adam, says Cortada, from the moment that he comes into the world, is touched on the side by Satan. Jesus and Mary are alone accepted. For God interposed between them and Satan, a veil which preserved them from his fatal touch.